declared a sinner, it seems only appropriate that my tale be one of greed instead of generosity. Now, I can't say for certain whether my story is true or not, for I wasn't there. It was told to me by my grandmother, but she was a good and honest woman, never known to tell a lie. In this town where my grandmother grew up, there was, in a farmer's field, a great circle of flowers and mushrooms, known as a fairy ring. It was said by all the townsfolk that on the nights of the full moon, the wee folk would come to this ring to dance and sing, to feast and make merry. It was also said that everything they had was made of gold and silver, a fact not lost on old Seamus, the town's miser. All Seamus desired was gold. Did I say desired? Oh, nay, too weak a word. Never did man love a woman or parent a child have so much as Seamus loved that glittering yellow metal. When Seamus heard of the fairy ring and the gold and silver to be found there, he determined that he would slip up to the ring one night and increase his store at their expense. So, on the night of the next full moon, old Seamus slipped up to the ring just as the sun was setting. Soon it was full dark and wiser folk were safely at home with the doors latched and the lamps lit. Seamus found a hiding place under some bushes and waited to see what would happen. Suddenly, ta-ra, ta-ra, Seamus heard the sound of trumpets. From the shadow of an oak tree there came a glow, and out of that glow trooped the fairy host. Lords and ladies trotted out on beautiful horses, their hounds leaping and barking behind them. The horses were no bigger than the cat that sleeps purring at the hearth. The hounds no larger than the rats the cat made chase, all of them collared and bridled in gold. Then came servants bearing tables and chairs, jugs of wine and ale, plates and mugs, all of it as the stories told made of gold and silver. Next came cooks and bakers, each bearing platters of the most delicious looking sweetmeats tongue or tummy could imagine. And finally out came a score of musicians bearing horns and harps and pipes and drums. They set to their work the musicians tuned their instruments and were always ready began to play. And as soon as they started to play, all of the fairies, great and humble, young and old, gathered round and began to dance. Old Seamus and his, all his ears had never heard sweeter music or watched for you dancing. As he watched, he almost forgot the reason for his errand, until a shaft of moonlight glittered off of a stack of golden plates. With so much there, he thought, they would not miss a little, and he slipped up to the table. Never did a cat stalk its prey as quietly as old Seamus stalked that table. Silently, silently, he crept upon the fairy's feast. Softly, softly, he reached out his hand. He hovered over the stack of plates and was about to grasp them when he let out a yelp of surprise and pain as a fairy dagger pricked his thumb. Oh yes, the fairies have a great deal of gold, and they haven't kept it all these years by being less than watchful. In less time than it takes to tell, Seamus was bound with ropes of gold. Fine as ever a lady wore about her neck they were, but to try as he might, the old miser could not break them. When he was well and truly bound, he was dragged into the ring and up to the lord of the feast. Gold is it you're after, he said, fixing Seamus with a stern gaze. Well, there be gold enough for you, Hope, but I welcome you be to it. And he ordered the guards to drag Seamus to the edge of the ring, out of the way of the dancers. Well, the sh those fairies gave Seamus a bad night. They pelted him with twigs and garbage, called him every sort of rude name. One particularly naughty little imp jumped up on his head and began dancing a jig on his nose. Finally, the first rays of dawn 
began to appear on the edge of the eastern sky, and in the distance, a rooster crowed in a farmer's barnyard. At its sound, the fairies ceased their revels. The lords and ladies got back on the horses, the servants picked up the tables and chairs, and in a twinkling, all were gone, with no sign that they had ever been before, save old Seamus, still bound at the edge of the ring. Well, thought Seamus, it was a poor time those fairies showed me, but at least I'll have the gold chains for my comfort. He looked down to admire them and discovered that they were gone. In their place were vines of a sickly greenish yellow. They broke readily enough when he tugged on them, but they were filled with sap which dripped everywhere. Nastier, slimier, smellier muck you couldn't imagine. And the old miser was soon covered from head to foot. Tired and dirty and smelly, Seamus headed back to the little cottage, hoping to reach home before anyone saw him. But on his way home, he met townsfolk on their way to work, farmers on their way to the fields, and children on their way to school. Nearly half the town saw Seamus, and those that didn't see him smelled him. So by nightfall, the old miser was the laughing stock of the community. Well, Seamus learned his lesson that day. And while he still loved gold, never again did he try to take what wasn't rightly his. And the rest of the town learned a lesson, too, about what happens to fools who disturb the fairies' revels. But it was a long, weary time before Seamus could get rid of the smell from those vines. Or so my grandmother told me.